Hello, I'm Sam Candy from Candy Consulting. Welcome to Sustain Talks. Today, I'm joined by Gwyn Jones, Director of Association of Sustainability Practitioners. Um, but so much more than that. When I first spoke to Gwyn, I was blown away by his insight. Um, and the conversation that we had was the one that made me want to do these interviews so everyone could hear the conversation. Um, Gwyn, hi, good to see you. How are you? Hi, Sam, doing fine, thanks. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah good. enjoyed the conversation last time as well. Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, why don't, I don't think that was a fair introduction. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit more about who you are and your background? Okay, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Obviously, 67 years is a lot to cram into a few minutes, but um, I think the, the main points are um, I spent about the first 25 years of my life um, helping set up and run consulting and business consulting uh, services and organizations across Middle East, Europe and Africa. Um, I dropped out of that or stepped out of it uh, about the turn of the century and have since then been um, engaged in really learning a different way of living, a different way of being, which you know, is sort of draws you towards sustainability. For the last sort of 10 years or so, I've been a director at the Association of Sustainability Practitioners, um, which is a membership-led organization to basically connect, support, and challenge people who want to learn together collaboratively how to move from unsustainable to sustainable practices. And that's involved me in lots of other different activities and some, some consulting on the side, but also lecturing at a number of universities in uh, sustainability and social entrepreneurship, which I think is the, the main way that we can bring sustainability to life and to, to have impact in the world. Um, yeah, and just recently I've moved into a different phase of, uh, of my life and what I'm doing where I'm trying to set up and um, create spaces for intergenerational discussions. I spent a lot of time working with people like Satish Kumar and Mac McCartney over the years. I say working with, being influenced by. Um, and I think some of the work they're doing is fundamental. And it comes down to very simple ways of living and being and connecting now more than ever with future generations and creating a sustainable world for, for them to live into. Yeah. Do you think those future generations are... Um, more sort of focused on sustainability nowadays without a doubt I think um you know when I was 20 25 I just there was no need to even consider it no. you know we were brought up in a world where it was very much um get everything for yourself you know get good job get get grades get this get this get this and it was all get 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 and the success criteria then was very much about what you could acquire yeah. um in every dimension um and we've seen the consequences of that where we are today in the world is very much a consequence of the individualism the let's not worry about other people let's not worry about the consequences so for me the awakening was was quite abrupt and very deep but when i work with young people now i am absolutely blown away by the the awareness they have and not the not being overwhelmed by the scale of the problems which i quite often am but their um not just desire but they just see the need to do everything differently than we did not yeah. go down that same cul-de-sac that we did of of self-improvement but really um you know looking after what is going to look after them for the future so i i, I believe the future is in great hands i just um well bearing in mind the um situations we've seen in europe in the last few days yeah I literally hope we have enough time. Yeah. Um, that we haven't passed the tipping points already. But yeah. I think the future is in good hands if we can help them to create the futures that they need. I guess it's getting to that point, you know, where they can move forward from. So um, interestingly, I think, and I know you do too, but the climate crisis is at an absolute urgency. Um do you want to tell talk more about your feelings on that what why you think we really are some people are like oh you know there's some floods and that's fine but I don't think people really understand the depths of how urgent it is I think the yeah the single most um shocking statement over the last few days has come from a number of scientists now on every opinion on every subject there's a range of opinion from denial to extreme you know acceptance if you like yeah 
Um, so this is the view of the extreme acceptance, but that view has shifted over the last 10 days. Up to this point, it was a question of the extreme people were saying, this is an emergency, you know, that the world is on fire, the house is on fire, we have to do something. The Greta Thunberg, very yeah. clear, concise um, talk, which a lot of people just rejected as being too extreme. Most of us felt, no, she's articulating exactly where yeah. it is, it's just people don't like it. But the sort of weather events we've seen in, um, in Canada, particularly in Germany, yeah. France, um, Belgium, etc., um, apparently these are of such an extreme nature that none of the climate scientists believed we would get anywhere near that level of extremity unless we really went to the worst possible scenarios of climate change. So we've reached those points, which is something we thought we'd never do. We thought that the world would respond and react, albeit dramatically too slowly, but there is a possibility being discussed now in the extreme the conversations that we have already passed the tipping points that we thought we might be able to avoid in 10 years time. Wow. Now a tipping point, when you avoid it means there's no going back. It's when if you tip something over, at a certain point you'll go back. When it goes too far, it's gone. If, if, and it's a big if, if our, if our climate has gone past a couple of these tipping points, we may be literally looking at a radically different future, but not far in the future, starting from tomorrow. That's and that, really scary. Yeah, it is. Now, we all know that there's a balance, right? So maybe it's not quite as bad as that, but the mere existence of the possibility is frightening because I don't think even the most extreme scientists believed we had that possibility but now it's been openly discussed. Is there time? I don't think we had time anyway. We, you know, I, I got on board on this 15, 20 years ago and I was a latecomer. Yeah. Um, but some of the government official papers, the Stern report in 2007 predicted that if we do not invest enough money to solve climate change, we will spend 10 to 20 times as much learning to cope with it. Yeah. And they didn't know what we know today. Um, largely, you know, a lot of governments, business people, a lot of people just completely ignored it, said not in my lifetime. And yeah. for a lot of people, to be quite honest, that's going to be true. They're going to die before it happens. Yeah. Do you think that um, COVID has slowed it down? No, not at all. The The best way of looking at it, I mean, I was surprised at this because I, I I would thought this is one silver lining of the COVID cloud is that with all the drop in industrial production and traveling, et cetera, that we're, we're going to have a, see a dramatic impact. The best way of describing it is it, if, if your bath is filling up, overflowing with water, yeah. and you turn the tap a quarter of the way off or 5% off, you have no impact. The, all the critical limits still increased during shutdown. In other words, the amount of um, change that we need to introduce in the next five or six years, and we only have that, is going to dwarf the amount of change we've seen in the previous two years. My dwarf God. it. Mm. Yeah. Now, I don't know whether people like you and me can change that much in our private lives, and we're the ones that care. Yeah. The ones that don't care, will not even accept the need to change. But um, this change that we control and this change that's forced on us. Uh, so it's going to be a very fraught next five or six years. The good news is this morning, lots of world politicians are saying, now we have to stop polluting. Now we have to move off fossil fuel. We have to stop it now. No more talking. We need action. Yeah. That may be already too late, but but... Better late than never, in the sense, at least we could retrieve it. But it is a highly critical situation. Is that the only the first. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what's the other solutions? Well, there aren't any other solutions, but there are not lots more problems coming up behind it. We haven't even looked at the biodiversity loss. We yeah. haven't looked at the loss of arable, not arable land, but, but good quality topsoil. We're destroying forests. We're destroying biodiversity. We're destroying 
<clears throat> nature per se on a scale that all has to be reversed and not just stopped because it's already in a critical state. We have to reverse, we have to regenerate soil. We have to deacidify and cool down the seas. How the hell do you do that? The good news is that if you look at the, 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 third, the 16 um, SDGs that are the imminent threats to life on earth, mm. then although it looks like 16 different problems, they're not, they're all interconnected and interrelated. So the good news is that if we do avert the major problems with climate change, we will have to put in place measures that also start to work on the positive impacts on biodiversity, on reforestation, on life under the sea and all other SDGs. So it's not like we've got 17, 16 completely different problems to solve. They're all actually symptoms of one problem. And yeah. once we learn how to address one symptom, that learning will help us accelerate the changes we can make in the other one. So 15 and 16 will be a lot easier to solve than one because we'll have already done half the work or 75% of the work, whatever, to get it right. But they do require not just tinkering with systems. So electric cars, all electric cars have done is swap the fuel out of the vehicles that are you know, swamping our cities with roads and car parking space and causing pollution. Um, that's not a systemic change. The systemic change is when we learn, as the Dutch are doing, to live without cars. So the Meerwerder estate in Utrecht, 12,000 residents, yeah. zero cars. It's possible. It's desirable. Britain's about 70 years behind the thinking of Holland and other countries are further behind than we are. Yeah. But that it is possible. And by the way, the 17th one, 17th SDG to me is the most important because it the 16 are what we've got to tackle the 17th says how we do it so instead of being individualistic and look at my backyard and my particular situation number 17 says how we solve it it's called partnership collaboration yeah. and that's important because that is forcing COVID is forcing the world leaders to at least some of the time think globally and not nationally there are exceptions bolsonaro trump etc they are only interested in what happens in their backyard yeah and we've seen the consequences so bringing people together to solve global problems with global thinking is the only way out of this yeah you know we can vaccinate ourselves as much as we like in britain but we still can't accept people coming into the country yeah that's not like life as normal that's not going back to a normality that's saying we can build an island and reinforce the island and build the walls higher, but it won't stop COVID getting in. We so, have to vaccinate the world. We have so to think to, and act globally. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I just listen to you forever, but I know people have so many questions, you know, to um, understand what they can do. And is it even, you know, I'm telling people just do something, Absolutely. like make a difference. <clears throat> Um, because, OK, so me and you, everyday lives, changing our lives or just us giving up our cars or eating less meat, we're not going to save the world. Planting some trees, we're not going to save the world. But we have to obviously, you know, leave that to our leaders. And hopefully now with the climate crisis that they're seeing and if it's happening in their own backyard, all of a sudden they're going to wake up. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't not do anything you know what what if, if you're talking to the ceo of um a corporation um you know medium-sized corporation what would mm -hmm. you be telling them to do in their business i would be telling them to do in their home first i would really? say go and talk to your children yeah ask them what do they think you're doing at work tomorrow? Yeah. What are the most important things on your corporate agenda tomorrow? Right. Let them tell you what they think there. And when you if you can listen to them, if they will talk to you about it, then sit there and think, is that what you're doing? Because it probably isn't. Mm. But then the next question I feel is really the most important one. 
ask your children what they hope you're doing at work tomorrow mm. because I suspect that most of the answers will be around creating a world that I can live in. Mm. Now, I don't care what your business is, be it if it's a consultancy, if it's a service industry, if you're a doctor, if you're a bus driver, if you're a banker, mm. you can all do something. Because at the moment, what we're all doing by default is destroying the world. All our manufacturing process do fundamentally is take natural resources, reconstruct them into products, throw away the bits we don't want, and then eventually release the products, hope they'll be trashed as quickly as possible so that someone will buy the next one. So our production, the, the classic production model, is simply take all the Earth's resources, trash them, and throw them away. So yeah. There's got to be a limit, and we've reached it in many cases now, as to how long the Earth can keep providing natural resources. We are exceeding our natural resources. So what is your company doing? One of my friends gave me this beautiful quote, which is, sounds, it sounds really stupid when you say it, but the alternative is horrific. And it's true. The alternative is the way we live. So the simple thing he says is, I want the world to be a better place for every day that I live on it. So to that CEO, I would say to him, probably, or her, hopefully, how is your business going to enrich the earth and the societies, the people and all living things on the planet every day so that it's, there's more resources at the end of your shift yeah. than there were at the beginning? Because yeah. if they're not, then you, like everybody else, are just trashing the planet in mostly for this ob obscene thing that's just the enrichment of a few shareholders, just for creating a bit more money, which is an artificial concept anyway, for rich people. Yeah. Now, that's a bit extreme, but that's fundamentally what we are. So what we've seen over the last couple of decades is businesses and organizations starting to shift dramatically to, to reduce their impact on the planet. Well, that's brilliant. But it's still not enough, because if you like last couple of years, we've reduced our impact on the planet, but we're still having a negative impact on it. There's almost no organizations that have moved from having a, a net negative impact on the planet to a net positive impact on the planet. The only one I know is Interface Floor, and they set that target in 1995. And in doing so, they became the most profitable version of themselves ever. So that's... The, the holy grail. If you don't spend money trashing the planet and then spend money clearing up the mess you've made, just think of how much money you could spend on creating good and extra resources. And it's not that difficult. It's just that every model we have, our educational model, our political model, our business model, is sending you in the opposite direction. They're actually designed to stop you doing that. Not by some devious plan, yeah. by accident. Nobody thought we had to worry about these things. Interesting enough, the environmentalists in 1975 predicted the financial crash of 2008 and nine. Environmentalists, not economists, right? And this is the nub of it. So this comes back to the, the nub of what your question is, is that they knew that would happen with certainty because they could see the way we were looking after or not, the way we were treating the planet. And they know how interconnected everything is, the whole Gaia system. Yeah. And they know that if you treat the planet, planet that badly, one day it will be uninhabitable. And the first thing that will go are the models that are depending upon the Earth being abundant. And that's our financial model. That was the, the canary in the coal mine. And it happened within about five years of when they predicted. They didn't know how it would happen. They just knew that if you, it's like if you treat a child badly, then one day that child's going to do something really of awful. Course, yeah. It's that inevitable. And COVID is a consequence of how we treat the planet. Yeah. I don't care whether it came out of a lab or whether it came out of a market. It's mankind's interaction with nature. Yeah. our way of abusing it, of treating it like a, a free resource that we can just squander. Just recently, just yesterday, 
it's found out that thousands of racehorses are being slaughtered inhumanely in abattoirs and these all come out of the racehorse industry right that's shocking how do these people that allegedly love horses allow them just to be disposed of in such i was going to say inhumane ways i'd actually say in inhuman ways you know yeah that's just an indication of how we treat the things that enrich us so yeah. we can change all the things you mentioned all these small steps yeah. are irrelevant if you just treat them as small if one treats them as small steps so just think about this just think about what relationship at the moment do you have to the planet and all living things on it is it a loving relationship or an exploitative relationship? So is every act you do a, a result of being exploitative or being loving? And when you answer that question, when your children tell you what they hope you're doing at work, it's, it's you know, do you love your children enough not to buy them lots of toys and flashy trainers and whatever now, but do you love them enough to give up your current ideas of wealth and ownership to leave them a future that they can hand on to their children that's yeah. love loving children is not taking them on holiday and ski holidays etc that's just trivia yeah. so unless we can learn to nurture what nurtures us which is nature all things will die and that's a peruvian indigenous saying that's that's been handed down orally in the peruvian cultures for over five thousand years it predates the pyramid stonehenge all these solid things we see as civilization that one phrase i believe is the key to all the remedies we have to put in place we just have to make sure that everything we're doing and thinking is born out of the desire to love and look after nature because then it will look after us yeah that, um, you know, I, I, I could go on forever and <laughs> talk to you, but to leave it on such a poignant um, comment, I, 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 I want to sort of hold some back because we're going to speak again and I've got more yeah. things to share with you. Um, but for me, that, um, you know, and that was pretty much what we spoke about, what was really interesting. I, I spent the weekend with somebody that works at Interface um oh, so, wow. yeah very very <laughs> very interesting but um yeah and i heard that they've just uh, created the first carbon zero flooring or something um that's right yeah yeah absolutely yeah and it was you that sort of had said to me originally um that you thought that so so people should definitely go and have a look at what they're doing um Gwyn, I, I, I can't thank you enough for, for giving me your time. Um, probably shorter than the last time, but I want to hold some back because, uh, yeah, we've got more Short to share in the future. Um, thank you again so much. I um, Just that insight, I think that's going to give companies a lot to think about. And we, we can make a difference. We can make an impact if we really think about the way that we live our lives and the more you know I, I've been in a few industries over the last 10-15 um, years where I've seen those industries take a real um, big step over the last two years towards sustainability that I hadn't seen before so it is yeah. happening um, we just have to move quicker and hope yeah. that our leaders are going to uh, make a very big difference at um, COP this year. And, and that's what that's why it's so important for all those things you mentioned, all those little things, because yeah. once you start doing those little things, you realize they compound each other. Yeah. Yeah. But they compound how good you feel about yourself. That you're yeah. suddenly moving away from all the destruction. We all do. You know, I've just driven the car down to a beach that's yeah. polluting the air. Right. Yeah. I know that. Yeah. And I do other things. But once we start as individuals start feeling holding the guilt if you like but not yeah. letting it paralyze us and moving towards doing something good every day little things yeah. you know just doing a bit more recycling then it builds up your self-esteem yeah and boy do we need that it, it really builds does up 
And it builds up our courage to turn around to our politicians and say, wake the fuck up. I am not going to vote for you. Yeah. Unless you do this. That's the only way they will do it because yeah. they are so heavily invested in the current financial model. Yeah. But, you know, and we're seeing what Johnson and his government are doing. You know, they're, they're holding COP26 while opening a coal mine of all things. Just optically, they should be, you know, someone from the PR and, PR and media world ought to be saying to them, that is the dumbest thing you could ever do. That's outrageous. But that's like Boris uh, flying on a private jet down to um, exactly. uh, G7 the other week, you know? Yeah. So if we stand back and wait for our leaders, we'll be dead. And so will they before yeah. they do anything. Um, but... As, you know, it's like everything in sustainability, you know, as you go in as a sustainability manager in a company, you work out how to engage yeah. the naysayers first. And it's always, what are their objectives? How can I help them achieve their objectives my way? Yeah. So we've got to help them. We've got to show them that, um, you know, we do need active travel. We don't need cars, but we've got to get that in our own heads as well. But yeah. people will get this very quickly. Yeah. But all those steps moving to away from to, to moving to being less unsustainable are all rehearsals for the big one. Yeah. So this yesterday, Greenland has just stopped all fossil fuel activities. Yes. Overnight. Now, yeah. let's not kid ourselves. They were probably planning to do that anyway. But they've taken that step. They've made the announcement and they've done it not to make them look good. They've done it to say, now what's your call? Yeah. What are you going to do? You're going to keep doing it or you're going to pull back? Yeah. So companies like countries like Norway have a you know problem there because the whole sustainable living is built on fossil fuel and yeah. the continued extraction of it. So but these are challenges. So COP26 is going to be radically different because of the tragedy that's unfolding in Central Europe at the moment. Yeah. And the irony is that Germany is probably one of the most progressive countries and always has been on the green agenda. Yeah. Um, Canada and North America, I literally were saying, well, that fucking serves you right. You know, yeah. Trudeau just tried to fight Biden to stop that oil pipeline. But the climate is never going to, um, you know, it's not going to pick and choose. It's that's why the whole world has to pull together. It's not going to say, oh, that country is doing good. We're, we'll leave them for today. It's that, but that's like COVID, you know. Um, well, this is it. You know, and, and when we talk about those tipping points being passed, we're literally into unknown areas. This is the Donald, Donald Rumsfeld. We know we do not know what will happen when the tipping points are gone. Yeah. Now, if you think of a tipping point as the thing collapses, well, does that mean that those temperatures they've seen in British Columbia are going to stay. And I don't mean come back. Yeah. I mean stay. Because yeah. the jet stream has been shifted. There's no saying it will ever go back. No. If it doesn't revert back, then that part of Canada will turn into Bangladesh. Yeah. 40, 50 degrees continuously. That's yeah. uninhabitable. No, that changes everything, doesn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you'd asked, if we'd had this conversation last week, it would have been. It would have been very focused. different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But look, I'm I'm about spreading the sense of urgency, and that is what this uh, conversation has done. And yeah. I'm grateful uh, to you for sharing your thoughts and your insight. And uh, I always look forward to speaking again. Thank you so much for your time. Um, cool. I'm sure we're going to get lots and lots of feedback when I post this um, in a few weeks' time. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I um, thanks a lot, Gwyn.